yeah, I'm really excited to welcome Lisa O'Brien virtually to join us here in Constance. Um, Lisa is joining us from um, Rice University in, in Houston, um, where she is a Rice Academy Fellow. Um, so Lisa is a truly interdisciplinary researcher. Um, she started doing her um, PhD at the University of Minnesota, where she worked in um, primatology, um, looking at foraging, social and communication behaviors in chimpanzees in both observational field studies and also captive experiments. Um, she then went on and got a um, McDonnell Fellowship, which is a, a fellowship for studying complex systems that allows you to go anywhere in the world. And she went to the N New Jersey Institute of Technology um, where she developed her own tech for studying the role of communication in collective behavior in baboons, sheep, and goats, as far as I'm aware, um, working with Simone Garnier and some other collaborators. Um, and she's now um, moved over actually to a psychology department at um, Rice University, where she's studying similar topics, uh, linking communication and group behavior in humans using wearable devices. Uh, so I personally have found Lisa's work to be incredibly inspiring. She's really somebody who's been pioneering this interface between communication in, and collective behavior in um, natural social groups, both in humans and animals. And I also find it like particularly impressive that Lisa is someone who has even been developing her own tech um, to um, address these topics and has also delved really deeply into some of the analytical side, including um, doing some work in machine learning, which I don't know, she may present some of that. Um, and I think it's particularly exciting for the cluster to have somebody who really spans this gap between um, non-human animals and human social groups and is really thinking about this in a very broad way. So for all those reasons, I'm really excited to have Lisa with us today. And we're sorry you can't be here in person, but hopefully sometime in the future, we'll get you out here to Constance. Um, I just wanted to mention that there's going to be a virtual coffee hour with um, Lisa uh, to talk about, um, well, it's gonna be a, a bit determined by who shows up, but probably we're going to talk about communication and collective behavior in humans and non and non-human animals. So um, hopefully that will be a nice interdisciplinary discussion and you're all invited. That will be at 4.15 PM tomorrow. And I will put the, the Zoom link was in the um, email that Felicia sent out, but I'll also put it in the chat. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Lisa and we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, so um, hello, I'm Lisa O'Brien, um, and thank you so much, Ari, for the introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today virtually, and hopefully at some point in the future, I might be able to be there um, in person to um, chat with all of you um, about these topics. But today I'm going to be talking about my work centered on communication and collective behavior in non-human and human social groups. So many studies of collective behavior, particularly in the study of vertebrates, focus on the positions of group members. This work has been facilitated by technology that enables the precise and continued tracking of individuals, both in the lab and in the field. Uh, for example, these images represent the trajectories of fish, uh, humans, and baboons. And this focus on position enables the tracking of physical interactions between group members and the study of how these interactions scale up to impact patterns of group-wide behavior. Similarly, models of collective movement behavior emphasize physical interactions and information made available to animals through their visual system. For example, individuals may respond to the positions of all individuals within a certain distance, a fixed number of nearest neighbors, uh, those sharing a neighboring boundary or those within one's visual field. Through these methods, great advances have been made in understanding collective movement behavior. However, this focus on position has the potential to mask other information channels. Today, I'll be making the argument that vocal communication is critical for understanding many collective behaviors. And by communication, I mean signals that evolve due to the effect that they have on the behavior of receivers. So vocal signals are capable of transmitting information or mediating social interactions when visual range is limited or when individual spacing is wide. Vocal signals can also increase one's ability to influence the behavior of receivers, for instance, by advertising personal information about the environment or one's motivational state. Communication can also enable the negotiation of decisions or behaviors before any action is taken. 
And because of these abilities, considering the role vocal communication plays in collective behavior um, may provide key insight into how organisms coordinate their activities in complex social and ecological environments. So my research sits at the intersection of the study of communication and collective behavior, because I believe that each is essential to understanding the other. The central questions in my research program are how do social and environmental variables, such as signaler traits, social structure, environmental or task complexity, impact individual behavior and signal production? How does signal production impact the behaviors of individual receivers? And how do the behaviors of multiple signalers and receivers impact patterns of group-wide cohesion, coordination, and decision-making? I'm currently working on two sets of projects focused on communication and collective behavior. The first set of projects focus on vocalizations and collective movements in free-ranging mammals. The second set of projects focus on communication and collective intelligence in human teams. So I'm first going to talk about my projects focused on vocalizations and collective movements. I'll begin by, by providing an overview of work I conducted examining the role vocalizations play in the regulation of group cohesion in free-ranging domesticated goats. I'll then discuss my current work examining the role vocalizations may play in facilitating the timing and direction of group moves in wild baboons. This work was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Simon Garnier at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, Dr. Andrew King at Swansea University, and Dr. Kai, Guy Kalashaw at the Zoological Society of London. And funding for this project was provided by a James S. McDonald Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the New Jersey Institute of Technology. So in order to study collective behavior, it's essential to collect data on the behaviors of multiple group members simultaneously. And this is no simple task, especially because these, uh, when these groups are free ranging. So in order to advance studies of collective behavior and communication, I developed in-house wearable data loggers with support from the Swansea Lab of Animal Movement. Their existing design contained GPS units and accelerometers and magnetometers. And I built upon this design by adding audio recorders. So our data loggers were capable of containing, obtaining a continuous data on vocal activity GPS location, and acceleration and orientation. With these three devices, our data loggers are capable of collecting um, data on position, movement, and vocal activity of multiple collared individuals simultaneously. The picture on the left shows our original model with flexible microphone positioning, and the photo on the right shows the inner workings of our later model. This work was conducted at Salvis Nature Park in Namibia. Guy Kalashaw has been director of the Salvis Baboon Project since 1990 and has long-term data on the baboons inhabiting the park. In addition, a herd of domesticated goats and sheep ranged the property, which enabled us to test our collars on a comparatively simpler system before deploying them on baboons. So I'm first going to focus on the work I conducted with goats to examine the question of how vocalizations regulate group cohesion. I connected this work with several additional collaborators and with support from the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Sciences Institute. So goats are highly gregarious species that display coordinated herding behaviors. In addition, during social separation, they produce vocalizations, display increased levels of movement, and also have higher heart rates. This is an example of one such what one such vocalization can sound like. So our research questions for this project were, do loss calls facilitate the repair of group cohesion? And if so, through what behavioral mechanisms? We had two hypotheses for the behavioral mechanisms through which vocalizations may aid the reestablishment of group cohesion. The vocal beacon hypothesis proposes that calls attract other group members towards the signaler. And the straggler hypothesis proposes that calls slow or stop group movement away from the signaler, enabling it to more readily catch up. So I conducted this study with free-ranging goats at Salvis Nature Park. 
I separated 16 goats from a larger herd of goats and sheep and allowed them five days to become accustomed to their new social environment. For the remaining 10 days, we collected data from our collars as well as observational data. And during this time, the goats were free ranging for five to six hours per day. However, since these are domesticated animals, I occasionally had to herd them, such as away from their pen um, and to their pen at the end of the day, and also away from park boundaries. And these periods are not included in analysis. So before analyzing our data, we first had to extract the vocalizations from our continuous audio recordings. We trained a support vector machine on the amplitude and fundamental frequency of known vocalizations, as well as non-vocalizations. Um, this is showing the amplitude of um, the audio over time with these sections in red representing the calls of the individual that was wearing the collar. So as you can see, these calls are a lot louder than um, other calls in the nearby area, as well as background noise. So when tested against a subset of known vocalizations, we had a success rate of 88.7% for detecting um, these vocalizations. And this resulted in a data set of 244 vocalizations that we then manually verified um, that fell during periods of interest in which the herd was free ranging. So we first investigated how the spacing of the herd impacted call production. In our analyses, we compared the distribution of distances we observed um, in our real data to those observed in randomized data sets. We first examined the maximum group member distance from the center of the herd at the time of call production by any group member to the maximum distance observed during randomly selected time points. So the graphs on the left display histograms of the randomized and real data sets. And the graph on the right, areas in which the confidence interval do not overlap the red line represent periods in which the real data set is significantly different from the randomized data. We found that call production was significantly less likely when the maximum group member distance from the center of the herd was small. So in periods where the group is relatively compact. And we found that call production was more likely than expected when maximum group member distance was very large. So when the group was more dispersed. So we next examined the distance um, to the center of the group of the individual who actually gave the call. And we compared it to the distance of randomly selected group members during the time of call production. We found that individuals that produced the calls were less likely than expected to be close to the center of the group and more likely than expected to be far from the center of the group. Lastly, we repeated the above analysis, except that instead of looking at the actual distance of the signaler, we looked at the ranked distance, where a rank of zero reflects individuals that are closest to the center of the herd, and a rank of one reflects individuals who are furthest from the center of the herd. And we found that individuals further from the center, that the individual the furthest from the center was significantly more likely than expected to produce vocalizations. So in summary, calls are more likely to be produced when group spread is wide, and the individual who produces the call is more likely to be the one that is far from the center, and especially if it's the furthest individual from the center of the group. So we next investigated whether call production was correlated with the reestablishment of group cohesion. This graph displays a measure of group spread over two different six hour periods. The y axis reflects the maximum group member spread from the center of the group and the x-axis is time. The vertical dotted lines indicate instances in which one group member produced a vocalization. So as you can see, the calls tend to correspond with peaks in group spread. And when you align the timing of all calls, you can see that group spread was never significantly greater than at the time of call production, which is time zero here. You can also see that the group was significantly more cohesive before compared to after the call. These results indicate that calls are associated with a peak in group spread as well as its subsequent contraction. So we examined how group member behavior changes surrounding the time of call production to determine how these calls might facilitate this contraction. 
To do this, we measured the velocity of the collar relative to the center of the group during the time period surrounding call production. So in this graph, which I'm going to show you in a, a second, on the x-axis is um, time relative to the time of call production at time zero. And the y-axis reflects the velocity of the collar relative to the center of the group. So when I present the data, if the lines are above the red line, it means that the signaler is moving towards the group. And if the lines are below the red line, it means that the signaler is moving away from the group. So here are the data. And so as you can see, um, at the time of call production, it's associated with a peak in uh, movement of the signaler towards the group. So we also examined the velocity of the group center relative to the signaler. So again, I'm going to show you a similar graph. And in this case, lines below the red line mean that the group is moving away from the signaler. And if lines above the right red line indicate that the group is moving towards the signaler. So we found that call production was correlated with an increase in group velocity away from the signaler prior to call production, and then a reduction in group velocity away from the caller following call production. So to summarize, um, calling is associated with a peak in the signaler's, signaler's movement towards the center of the group, as well as the group's reduction in movement away from the signaler. And together, these behaviors can aid the reestablishment of group cohesion. So in summary, I found that individuals are more likely to call when they're far from the group. Calls correlate with the cessation of expansion and the subsequent contraction of the group. And also calls are correlated with a reduced centroid velocity away from the caller, which corresponds with the straggler hypothesis, where the individual that's falling behind produces vocalizations while trying to um, catch up with the group. And these vocalizations facilitate a reduction in movement away from the caller. So key takeaways um, from this work are that for goats, it's not all about position. So even if individuals are try trying to stay together visually, it may not always be possible when vegetation inhibits visibility or for instance, the act of foraging disrupts the tracking of group members and vocalizations can aid this process. So the system cannot be understood without taking vocalizations into account. So for instance, it may be tempting to fit something like an elastic model to the data, which explains how it expands and then contracts over time. While this may describe the physical positions of individuals over time, it would not accurately represent the mechanism through the, which this behavior is achieved. So if we ignore um, communication signals, we can't fully understand the system. However, I wanted to briefly note that while communication is important for understanding some collective behaviors, it may not be for all. So my collaborators and I currently have an article in press examining the role visual signals may play in the collective departure decisions of goats. We found that collective departures can be better explained by individuals simply responding to the movement behaviors of their neighbors, rather than by taking into account any visual signals reflecting directional preferences. So determining the context in which communication is important for understanding collective behaviors is an important topic for future research. So now I'm going to focus on some of my current work focused on investigating the role that vocalizations play in the timing and direction of movement decisions in baboons. While baboons produce a variety of vocalizations, one of their most common is the grunt, which is shown in the spectrogram here. Play that again. So that's an example of what a grunt sounds like. So grunts are soft, harmonically rich vocalizations, and they've been found to be individually distinctive. They're also produced in a variety of contexts, such as during social interactions, in the context of group moves, and while traveling and foraging. Our research questions for this project are, what role do grunts play in the coordination of collective movement behavior? 
And our non-mutually exclusive hypotheses are that group-wide grunting behavior facilitates decisions regarding the timing of group movement initiation. So for example, pre-departure signals have been proposed uh, to advertise individuals' motivation to begin moving with the, group in, with the group initiating a group move once a quorum of individuals begins signaling. Our other hypothesis is that groups influence the direction of group departure. For, in, for instance, by advertising motivation to travel in the direction in which the signaler is moving. So as in the study with goats, we collected data using our data loggers that had continuous GPS acceleration and audio. We fitted our collars on nine adult wild baboons, which represented 60% of the adults. And the baboons wore the data loggers for 30 days in June of 2016 at Salvis Nature Park in Namibia. And our audio data only covers the first 10 days of this period. Um, preliminary analyses I'm presenting today focus on 10 morning departure events from their sleeping cliff. And we're currently working to extend these analyses to additional movement events during other periods during these days. So to test our hypotheses, we need to extract data again on the timing of call production and also the timing of group departure. So we trained a deep neural network to differentiate between verified grunts and other vocalizations and background noise. When tested against a validation data set, we had 98% success rate in detecting grunts. To estimate the timing of departure, we calculated each individual's net square displacement over the two hours surrounding departure, which represents the distance each individual had moved from where they awoke that morning. We then used change point analysis to identify the onset of rapid movement away from their sleeping cliff. So today I'll be focusing on the timing of the first colored individual to depart, um, the time in which the majority of colored individuals had departed, and the time in which the last colored individual had departed. So this is a visualization of one departure event. So um, in our study, baboons almost always uh, slept on this sleeping cliff. So they would go out during the day and forage and typically end up back on this sleeping cliff. And when they wake up the next morning, they spend time socializing with one another. Um, they a lot of time grooming and various social interactions. And as the morning um, wears on, individuals will start to um, move in directions of intended departure. And so as you can see, we'll see um, this individual in red begin to move a little further out um, towards the direction that the group um, will eventually begin departing. Um, other individuals are still socializing, but eventually other group members will um, slowly begin to follow. So I'll just let you um, watch this process. So this is a visualization of the GPS trajectories that you were just seeing in that animation um, during one departure event. And then this is showing the same trajectories now in gray, um, along with blue dots, which represents the location in which a vocalization, a grunt was given by one of the collared individuals. Um, we do have data from all collared individuals, but I'm just showing one here uh, for visualization purposes. So for each departure event, we visualized call rate, um, representing the number of grunts per minute relative to the estimated times of departure. These first graphs will focus on early departures, which is reflected by the first collared individual to begin departure. So these are graphs um, showing um, one departure event on each day. On the x-axis is time and the y-axis is call rate over time. And I'm going to be showing you the combination of these graphs um, over here on the right. So we combine these graphs by finding the median call rate over time relative to the time of departure, along with the 95% confidence interval, which is displayed in this graph here. So again, on the x-axis is time relative to the time of the first individual to depart, which is um, time zero here. And the y-axis is median call rate over time. So as you can see, 
grunting behavior increases after early individuals uh, begin to depart. So in addition to plotting call rate against the time of the first colored indiv individual to depart, we also plotted call rate relative to the time in which a majority of colored individuals had departed in the time of the last departure. So at the time of majority departure, there is a high call rate of grunting beforehand, as well as a peak in calling after departure. In addition, call rate remains high as the last individual is departing and then begins to de decrease after that. So you can see that call rate is high across the entire departure period. This high call rate uh, could be due to grunting that occurs prior to majority departure. For instance, uh, where individuals are advertising their motivation to, to depart. However, it could also be due to grunting that occurs after individuals start departing. In order to differentiate between these alternatives, we plotted the rate of calling as detected by each data logger against the time of departure of the individual that was wearing that collar. And we combined these data across all individuals. We found that the calls detected by each data logger increased after the departure of the individual wearing that data logger. So this finding does not support the hypothesis that calling um, reflects motivation to begin moving. Rather, we're seeing that calling increases after individuals have al already begun departing. So while data loggers detect the vocalizations of the focal individual, uh, so the individual wearing the collar, they're also capable of detecting vocalizations from individuals who are nearby. So we wanted to examine whether this increase in grunt rate after departure may be due to closer proximity between individuals during this period. This graph shows the median nearest neighbor distance over time relative to the time of departure. So as you can see, individuals were not in closer proximity to neighbors following departure. So there's no evidence that the increase in call rate we, we observed after departure was due to the closer proximity to neighbors during this period. So summary, summary of these preliminary results are that grunting is associated with the context of departure. There's evidence that grunting increases more after departure compared to before. And the increase in call rate does not appear due to closer proximity. Thus, rather than controlling the timing of departure, there's evidence that grunts may impact the progression of departure after it begins. We're currently examining whether grunts may impact the direction of group travel following departure. So this is a visualization of one departure event in which individuals departed from the lower right-hand corner and moved in different directions until they came back together and moved towards the upper right-hand corner. The points in teal represent the location of each grunt produced. So we're interested in examining what role vocalizations may play in um, the decision-making following departure. In addition, we're working to expand analyses to de additional departure events throughout the day. So this is showing one day's worth of data where individuals began at the sleeping cliff over here and they made a loop through the park and ended up back at the same sleeping cliff. And each of these blue dots is um, representing the location in which um, a grunt was produced. So by expanding our analyses to additional departure events, we'll be able to uh, determine whether we're see seeing similar patterns that we see from their initial sleeping cliff or whether we see um, different patterns um, during different types of departure events. So key takeaways are that more work is needed on understanding the function of vocalizations involved in the coordination of group behaviors. Um, also more work is needed on understanding how vocalizations are integrated into collective movement decisions. Um, but results from our studies, we hope to shed more light on the role that vocalizations play in coordination and collective movement behavior. So the previous studies described um, demonstrate the role vocalizations can play in collective behavior in animal groups. And so I'm now going to shift gears to discuss studies examining the role vocal communication can play in collective behavior of human groups. So I'm currently working to understand how patterns of vocal behavior impact collective decisions in human teams. 
I'm approaching studies of this topic with inspiration for studies of swarm intelligence in animal groups, which I described in a paper I published this year in the Journal of Intelligence. So collective intelligence has been defined as intelligence which involves group rather than individual mental effort. In contrast to overall performance, the term collective intelligence describes the increase in effectiveness that team members gain by working together. So for example, a team of poor performers could display high collective intelligence if they perform better than they could on their own, while a team of high performers may display low collective intelligence if they don't gain much by working together. So how team members combine their cognitive resources may be just as or even more important to the emergence of collective intelligence than their cognitive resources themselves. So communication is an important component of teamwork that can facilitate the sharing, combination, and organization of individual knowledge, ideas, and perspective. Within industrial organizational psychology, it's often examined within the framework of the input process output model. So this model conceptualizes how team processes such as communication mediate the relationship between individual inputs, for instance, such as um, team member traits and team outputs, such as team performance. So for example, researchers may examine how inputs such as the personality of team members, the size of the team or the nature of the task relate to the quality of team communication and how the quality of communication relates to team performance collective intelligence or team satisfaction. Data on communication and other team processes um, are often summarized um, at the end of interaction periods or sampled at a few points throughout the study through the use of self-report methods or observation. Studies using these methods have provided important insights into the role communication plays in collective intelligence and team performance. So for instance, communication is found to positively relate to team performance. Communication is found to be more important for tasks that are complex or interdependent. And information elaboration has been found to be more important than information or knowledge sharing. However, shortcomings of these methods are that they're incapable of capturing important dynamics of a team's communication processes over time and how these dynamics relate to both input and output variables. So during a conversation, each individual speaking behaviors both shape and react to the behavior of other individuals. For example, this is a visualization of a real conversation between three speakers with each colored bar representing the timing and duration of individual speaking turns. This coordinated process is shaped by both implicit rules of conversational turn taking, as well as individual variation in speaking behaviors. For example, dominance level has been found to correlate with total speaking time and likelihood of interruption. And in mixed sex pairs, men talk more than women regardless of relative dominance. So team members' communication behaviors may combine in complex ways to shape the structure of interactions between them, which can then shape how their contributions are converted into team outputs. And in fact, there is evidence that communication dynamics can play an important role in team performance in collective intelligence. So for example, total speaking time may be connected to leadership. Unequal speaking time may negatively impact team outcomes, such as team performance. Another study found that centralization of speaking behaviors around a dominant team member interferes with skill utilization of other team members. So studying the structure of communication processes, even with no or minimal content, has the potential to shed light on important interaction mechanisms underlying the emergence of collective intelligence. So, sorry, go back. Um, all right, there we go. So in this regard, uh, studies of swarm intelligence can provide inspiration for um, gaining more insight into the role that communication can play in these processes. So significant progress has been made in understanding examples of swarm intelligence, such as honeybee nest site selection. So for example, by continuously tracking dancing behavior within the hive, the process of group consensus decision-making can be studied and detailed over time. This graph represents the direction of the nest site being advertised for over time. The circle on the left shows the dancing behavior two hours prior to the decision 
where nests in a variety of locations are being danced for. The graph in the middle shows data 45 minutes prior to the time of decision, where the number of locations being danced for has been stilled to two. And the graph on the, the right shows the communication behavior at the time of decision, where dancing has converged on one nest location. So by understanding how the information individuals possess about the quality of different nest sites and how that impacts their dancing behaviors and how dancing behaviors impact the behaviors of receivers, the entire process of decision-making can be tracked, analyzed, and modeled. And so these studies can provide a mechanistic understanding of how these complex collective behaviors um, are facilitated by uh, the role of communication and enable the prediction of specific dynamics and outcomes. So this approach is not only reserved for animal studies. So for example, a similar research approach has been applied to the study of human crowd behavior. Individual-based social force models have been used to model and predict crowd dynamics. And real-world behaviors such as lane formation can be measured and analyzed and linked back to the models. And even the progression of navigational decision-making can be studied over time through the continuous tracking of indiv individual movements. However, while this approach has been successfully applied to studies of crowd behavior, humans typically make decisions through their verbal interactions rather than their movement behaviors. So new methods are essential for connecting patterns of communication behavior to collective outcomes in human groups. So my current work is examining the following research questions. How do individual traits impact speaking patterns? How does a team's trait composition shape its communication dynamics? And how do communication dynamics shape team outcomes? By understanding how individual traits and speaking behaviors combine to shape conversation dynamics and how properties of these dynamics impact the combination of knowledge, ideas, and perspectives, we can gain a detailed understanding of the scaffolding upon which collective intelligence is built. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on the work we're connecting to answer this third research question. Um, however, if anyone is interested in these additional uh, two topics up here, I can talk more about the work of um, conversation modeling um, that I'm doing at the um, coffee talk tomorrow, or the coffee discussion tomorrow. So for this project, I'm collaborating with a multidisciplinary team of researchers from the areas of psychological sciences and engineering. And many of our projects are centered on the engineering design process. Um, this work is funded um, by Rice University, the National Science Foundation, and Microsoft. So our team has been using remote sensing technology to continuously measure verbal and nonverbal behaviors throughout the teamwork process through both observational studies of real world teams and experiments in the lab. However, right now is not the best time to be studying in-person social interactions. Uh, so at the start of COVID, we've shifted our studies towards the study of virtual teams. And this is the work that I'll be presenting today. So, so my research question is, how do communication dynamics shape team outcomes? In the study I'll be presenting, the hypothesis that I'm testing is that individuals with more speaking time shape team outcomes more strongly. And that there also may be a role for the quality of the ideas being presented, as well as the, uh, the speaker's personality. So for instance, their dominance level. The task in which I'm examining these topics is the Line Rider task. So Line Rider is a simple online design tool that allows you to um, create designs made completely out of lines. The goal of our task is to design a track that maximizes score within an obstacle, obstacle course. And I'm going to see if I can briefly demonstrate this. So if you can let me know if you um, see my screen when I pull up, um, this program. So are you able to see this? Yep. Okay, great. So this is what our course looked like. So the sled rider is over here and he's trying to make it to this box down in the lower right hand corner. And the goal is to design a line that allows the sled rider to pass through as many of these points as possible uh, while also um, remaining on the sled. So it's possible for the line rider to fall off if, for instance, the line um, becomes too steep. 
And so we're looking at um, teams ability to come up with a solution to this challenge that allows them to maximize the number of points that they obtain. So I'm just going to show you an example of what this looks like. So I'm just going to draw a line through here. And then you can play your design to see how it performs. So he did crash at the end of that one. Uh, what's great about this program is that through screen share, individuals can not only work on their own computers, but they can also collaborate um, with one another in designing these outcomes. All right, so uh, we had first started out with an individual brainstorming phase that was 10 minutes long. So each individual had time to think about their own solution to this problem without discussing it with anyone else. Then had a final decision-making phase, which lasted 15 minutes. So um, in some cases, individuals um, continued to work on their own, while in other cases, um, group members worked together with one another in order to come to a final decision. So in our individual trials, we had a brainstorming phase where individuals worked on their own. And then in the final phase, they just had additional time to begin to um, improve their decision. Whereas in team trials, um, each team member had a brainstorming phase where they worked individually. And in the final phase, they were able to collaborate with one another in order to um, come up with a group decision on their design. So first I wanted to examine whether teams did um, display greater performance over individuals. So here I'm going to show the performance of the designs of individuals that worked um, on their own throughout the entire study. So the red box represents the brainstorming phase and the blue box represents um, the final phase. And the Y axis represents um, how well their design performed on our task. So there was no difference between the initial and final designs in individual trials in terms of their performance. And so now this is showing the performance of the brainstorming trials for individuals in the team condition. So in this um, phase of the study, these individuals were um, working completely on their own. And so as you can see, there's no difference in the initial designs between individuals that worked on their own and individuals that were in um, the team phase. However, but once these individuals began working together, we saw that final team solutions performed significantly better than um, individuals that were working on their own. So this is evidence that teams do have an advantage in this task. So these are now showing box plots for just the teams. Um, the box on the left are um, the performance of the designs in the brainstorming phase, and the box on the right are the performance of the designs during the final phase. And I wanted to um, clarify, so during the brainstorming phase, individuals were not able to test the designs that they um, drew, so they did not have direct information on its performance. Um, we only tested the tracks once the study was over. So um, this graph is showing the median performance of the design of each group. So if we took um, the three designs of each of the um, team members working in the teams, and we found the design that fell in the middle in terms of performance, and we compared that with the performance of that team's um, final design, and we saw that final designs perform significantly better than the median um, brainstorming design. However, when we did the same and we looked at the best performing brainstorming design and we compared that to their group's final design, we saw that um, final designs did not perform significantly differently from the best brainstorming design of their group. So while groups did have an advantage over their average group member, they performed just as well as their best group member. So the advantage of this task is that since we're just dealing with lines, we're able to directly compare the design of the different um, designs that the team members come up with. So in this plot, um, X and Y are simply representing the coordinates of the tracks that they drew. So this is where the sled rider started out, and this is showing um, where the sled rider ended in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and so the different colors, so the three different colors here are representing the designs 
um, that each of the three team members came up with during the brainstorming phase. And the black line here is representing the design that the team came up with once they started working together. So they were able to come up with any design that they wanted. Um, they did not have to stick with any of the brainstorming lines. But in this example, the group decided to go um, simply with the design that um, this one team member produced. This is just another example of another set of solutions. So again, the three different colors are representing um, the different brainstorming solutions that individual came up with. And the um, track in black is representing the team's final design. And so what we're able to do is measure the distance between um, the final group design in each team member's initial um, solution. And so we're able to determine which solution the team design best matches. This is what this graph is representing here for a subset of our teams. So higher bars represent um, individual um, brainstorming solutions that were further from the group solution, whereas bars that are very low represent cases where the group's um, final solution was very similar to that team member's initial idea. So the value of this task is that we can examine how conversation facilitates the conversion of individual inputs to team outcomes. And we can look at this both in terms of the performance of their designs, as well as the actual design um, of their solutions, so that we can examine how communication behaviors, and as well as individual traits and the quality of ideas interact in order to influence the final group outcome. Sorry, one second. There we go. All right. So for our current studies, um, not only are we interested in better understanding um, the role that communication plays in impacting um, group decision making and collective intelligence, but we're also working um, to develop interventions that can help to improve teamwork um, in teams that are working together on collaborative tasks. So we're working to develop interventions based on findings of our studies. So for instance, we could have team members reflect on the behavior that they're displaying in their group. So we could ask team members to, for instance, reflect on general principles that we find are important for good team behavior. Um, or we could also have them reflect on um, data that's customized to reflect that team's interactions. So just as an example of this, this was a previous study that used a display um, that represented the relative speaking time of different team members, where this inner circle um, became uh, closer to a given team member if that uh, team member was dominating the conversation. So in this scenario, team member Y had a lot more speaking time than other team members, where in this scenario, they had approximately the same speaking behaviors. So by understanding how patterns of interaction um, impact team outcomes, we can help um, to design interventions that may be able to manipulate these patterns in order to shape um, more successful group outcomes. So in summary of all this work, um, it is that communication is important for understanding many patterns of collective behaviors. However, more work is needed on the function of vocalizations and how they impact collective behaviors. And new techniques are required to integrate vocal behavior and the progression of group outcomes. So my long-term research goals are to understand the social dynamics of successfully functioning groups, do basic research on non-human and human collective behavior, and application towards improving the functioning of animal and human groups. So with that, I just want to thank um, all of my collaborators and everyone who helped to make these projects uh, successful, as well as our funding sources. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for your talk. I appreciate it. It was really nice. Um, I have some questions about looking at the vocalizations themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a lot about looking at the timing of things, but you didn't talk much about any of the qualitative differences in timbre or any of the other things. Have you looked at that? Like, I mean, I, I don't know Babu and Grotz runs very well, but I think there's some type of repetition rate in it. 
um, you know, pulse type structure? Have you looked at things like that? Um, so which, which vocalizations are you referring to here? Um, I think in baboon grunts, at least some of the ones I've seen spectrograms for, I've never worked with them. It looks like there's almost a pulsation pattern to it, essentially a period of voicing, a brief off, and then a period of voicing. Is that correct? Um, so they produce grunts individually, um, but they can also produce them in sequences. So there can be um, variation okay. in terms of the number that they produced. We're just um, looking at the instances of single grunts. We're not um, combining them to, um, for instance, classify them into longer sequences. Um, okay. But you are very right that vocalizations are very different from one another. So right now we are lumping, uh, for instance, all grunts into the category of um, grunts that we're examining and we're treating them all similarly. Um, this is for simplicity for the time being. Um, I very much believe that differences in, for instance, the vocal properties of these grunts may reflect, for instance, um, different levels of motivation or um, it may reflect um, individual identity as been found in previous studies, which also may play a role in the effect of the grunts. Um, we are not currently taking that into account. We're um, simply, for our first step, um, focused on the timing, but these would definitely be um, factors that would be important for investigating in the future. Um, I have a question about the, going all the way back to the goats, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I, I don't think you actually mentioned this, but I was curious, like, so the straggler hypothesis would kind of suggest that the one that's calling would typically be in the back of the group. Is it usually the case that they, kind of just are um, abandoned because they're being too slow? Or is it also the case that they use this mechanism when one is kind of like going the wrong direction compared to the other ones? Well, in most cases, it was that one was lagging behind. So the most common scenario is when, um, for instance, they're foraging uh, within relatively dense vegetation and some individuals towards the front of the group begin to move off. And by the time individuals towards the back realize that they're already a ways away from um, the rest of the group members. And so that was the most common scenario um, that we had happen. Um, we did have a few observations in which, for instance, the group um, began to split and some individuals um, started going in different directions and they do produce vocalizations in those contexts as well. Um, but we didn't have enough instances of those to analyze, but I think that they could also be used in that scenario. Um, so I, want, I had a question about, the, about your results surrounding the role of grunts in influencing the timing versus direction of movement yep. decisions from these cliffs. And I guess I, I guess my question, I'm trying to formulate it in my head as I ask it, um, is, so if I understood correctly, you predicted that if, if grunts were involved in the t question of timing, when, mm -hmm. when to leave, yeah. that you'd see a peak in grunting preceding sort of the group movement. Yeah. And it looked to me, if, am I remembering correctly, that individuals grunt Start, themselves start grunting more once they've already started moving? Yes. So I guess to me that it, it I guess what I'm wondering is it, it, looking at your video, it looks like sort of individuals move out and kind of you sort of had that front edge pausing before the whole group went. There were almost like two movement decisions that got made, like these in, individual initiations and then the group kind of went. Yes. And I guess it wasn't clear to me that what you were showing us was inconsistent with the, the, the idea that baboons start grunting when they start moving in sort of an attempt to recruit. And then at some point you do get this critical mass that goes that it. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. Um, so you're, you're right with that example, the individual kind of started to move off and um, that was likely when our, um, methods for detecting departure um, identified that individual as departing. So it would okay. indicate that um, that individual began departing and then um, potentially was um, grunting as they were moving along. And so you are right that the progression, as the progression of departure goes, um, the grunting behavior of those individuals departing could be influencing the grunting of individuals that are still remaining on the cliff. Um, it, it is difficult to tease apart. So um, what we were expecting was what we see in a lot of um, other groups where individuals are relatively stationary and um, once the grunting or once the signaling 
of the group reaches a particular level that that is when um, the group departs. So it it is dependent on our definition of when the departure is. So is it when the departure initiates or is it when um, all group members um, begin initiating? So you're, that, that is something that we're going to have to think more about and how to interpret those data. Um, because you're right, if we are looking at the departure of the group as a whole, so when the majority departs, we are seeing that increase in grunting behavior mm -hmm. um, before the majority departs. But it's linked to grunting of individuals as they are already beginning to move. So it's it's slightly different from how these signals are, signals are often portrayed, um, but it's not completely inconsistent with that idea. Cool. Yeah, I guess I would just, it, it seems to me like it is not outside the realm of possibility in this particular signaling system that individuals don't really start the grunting until they themselves have started, like sort of this decision for the individual to move essentially precipitates their interest in recruiting other group members. Yes, yeah, no, I think, yeah, you, you make a very good point. And I'll definitely have to think about that more as we're looking at um, our additional departure events that we're extracting. Cool. Very cool. Very cool data. Thanks. Lisa, that was a um, really cool talk. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question about kind of teasing apart um, kind of the meaning of these grunts and initiating movement from just kind of like general waking up and getting active as a baboon. Are you able to, have you looked at the accelerometry data to kind of tease apart kind of the, like does the group, I, I guess what I'd be interesting to, interested to see is if like the group kind of achieves a steady state of kind of hanging out on the cliff, but awake and active, and then the grunts start and they move. Mm. Or, or, yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. We have not looked at the accelerometer data with the baboons yet. Um, but yeah, yeah, that would definitely be interesting to link it to additional activity of the group that may be independent of their actual movement behavior. But yeah, that would be really interesting to look at. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering because, you know, obviously they're sleeping before that. So I'm wondering at what that what part of that like dramatic uprise in in vocalization is just like they were awake, they were asleep and now they're awake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so um, Yes, you're right. By the time the callers came on um, in the morning, so we set them to come on at a particular time. So they were awake at those time periods. Um, so the initiation is not just them waking up. Um, it's they've been awake for a while. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one is from Julia, who asks, um, thank you so much for this great talk and about the vocalizations baboon and goat. When animals are very close to each other, how easy is it to assign calls to the focal tagged indiv individual based on call intensity only versus the non-focal individual? Um, she says, we're working on methods to solve that problem with uh, marine mammals. So I'm curious to know if that's a problem for terrestrial animals too. Yes, um, with goats, it was much easier um, because the collars are well, they're, they're right on their neck and their vocalizations are very loud. And so it really kind of overpowered the microphone um, for the individuals that were wearing um, those collars. And so it was much easier to identify um, when it was the individual wearing the collar that gave the call versus an individual nearby. And they also um, do not tend to be as close to one another as the baboons are. Um, the baboons, their um, grunts are much more quiet and they can also, uh, often be in very close proximity to one another. And so we are not, um, with our data, we're, we're trying to be very careful to not assume that the um, vocalizations are all by the one wearing the collar, but that that collar represents a kind of a mobile sensor that is within the group in the location where that individual is. And so we are trying to keep that in mind as we're analyzing our data, because currently we are not, um, we have not worked to individually identify the grunts. I think that is something that we could do in the future because we do have a large number of vocalizations now that we've obtained from each of the data loggers, but we have not reached that point yet. She says, thank you so much. And um, we have another uh, question in the chat from Wataru saying, um, also a great talk, thank you. Um, 
how do goat um, how goat individuals could know if they are the farthest from the center of the group? Or yeah, how do how do they know if they're the farthest from the group? According to this theorem you showed, it seemed that the farthest individuals were disproportionately more likely to call. Yeah, so I mean, I doubt that they knew that they were completely the, the furthest. They just knew that they, they could usually see the rest of the group. And so they could tell that the rest of the group was moving off and they were pretty far behind. And occasionally they weren't able to see the group at all. Um, it just happened that they um, were lagging behind and the group started to move off. And so it's not that they know for sure that they are the furthest. It just is that um, it's situations in which they just get left behind and are um, working to um, catch up with the group. Well, and then there's another one from Morgan who says also thanks for the nice talk um, on a similar question. How do goats know where the group is despite the cluttered environment? It feels like vocalization may be important to locate the group but from your data. It looks like they already have this info before calling. Yes, that's a very good point. So um, in many cases, they were able to see the rest of the group, but there were definitely situations in which they couldn't. Um, in these situations, it was still common for them to be the only one uh, producing the vocalizations, which does then rely on them to still, they, they still have to find the group. Um, there were some instances of counter calling where um, individuals, um, produce calls that were both far from the group and close to the group, but it was a very small subset of our data. And it was also not um, the situation where, for instance, an individual far away called and then an individual close to the group called to kind of facilitate that contact. Um, there was not a um, consistent order in which um, those calls were produced. Um, and so in our system, in our in our data, counter calling did not play a significant role, but it, it did sometimes occur. Um, and so it's unclear with our current data set um, what role that does play and whether that um, might result in different patterns. Um, we just didn't have enough data to test that. But um, in, in most cases in our data, they were able to see the rest of the group. Uh, so thanks for the nice talk, Lisa. I was actually wondering about your um, your sledding. Uh, game and I thought that was a really cool way to test some of these questions in human groups. Um, one thing that struck me is that it seemed like in some ways it's more of a consensus game than a coordination game because there's sort of people have to talk about which route might be best but there's not really any sort of um, or there doesn't seem to be much opportunity for them to coordinate their behavior. Do you think you could expand the game or modify it in such a way to sort of maybe tease apart differences between consensus and coordination? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, you're very right that this um, experiment was designed to test um, consensus decision making in uh, a scenario where um, different ideas had um, higher performance value. Um, and also one another shortcoming of this task is that it only allows us to see the final outcome. It doesn't allow us to see the process in which that outcome was achieved. And so we're actually um, this semester we're gearing up to run an additional virtual study using Minecraft where um, individuals will be working together as a team within Minecraft um, on a, a collaborative building task. And so this um, will involve more of the coordination aspects where they're building together in the team and we're working to um, develop methods to extract um, the process of building their outcome over time so that we can connect the progression of their vocal communication to the progression of their outcome on that task. 